Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning's message is, as I mentioned just a couple moments ago, taken from the New Testament lesson, the second chapter of the book of Acts, uh, the uh, first through fourth verses, special emphasis there, and once again, these words read. When the day of Pentecost, <coughs> excuse me, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is our text, dear family and friends in Christ Jesus. Amen. Recently, I came across a great story about an individual by the name of Charles Vance Millar. Maybe some of you have heard this story before. Uh, you see, Charles Vance Millar was an extremely wealthy lawyer in Toronto, Canada, who died in 1926. And with that, he left a will behind that, that really got all the people in that province of Ontario, Canada, talking. You see, Millar was a bachelor and, how should I say it, he had an extremely interesting uh, sense of humor. And, and that would be pretty clear with the things that he left uh, in his last will and testament. And, and looking at his last will and testament, it's probably safe to say there's never been a, a will that was written like his before, and I'm not sure if there's ever been a will written like his ever since then. You see. Uh, he did not have any uh, close heirs to him to inherit any of his fortune, and so he divided his property and all of his wealth in a way that, that amused him and, and I guess you could say really aggravated some of his newly chosen heirs. Let me give you a couple examples of what it is that I'm talking about. See, he left, he left shares in the, uh, to the Ontario uh, Jockey Club to two prominent men in Toronto. The only problem was that these two prominent men in Toronto were well known for their opposition to racetrack betting. He bequeathed shares in the O'Keefe Brewing Company, which was a Catholic-owned beer manufacturer, to every single Protestant minister in Toronto. But probably his most famous bequest was the one that he would leave the bulk of his fortune to, the Toronto woman who gave birth to the most children in the 10 years immediately following his death. Uh, as you could imagine, this really caught a great deal of attention to the people in Toronto and, and all sorts of different thoughts and all kinds of imaginations came to these individuals. And, and it's helpful to understand that at this time, uh, Canada was heading into this Great Depression. And the people, they were just struggling to make ends meet, struggling to make it from week to week, let alone to start thinking, adding multiple children uh, to the family. However, the prospect of this amazing financial windfall was quite alluring and quite appealing for the people. And so during that time, the, the newspaper reporters, they would oftentimes secure public records so that they would be able to find out likely contenders in what eventually became known as the Great Stork Derby. Uh, nationwide excitement uh, grew over this stork derby and, and people were just excited about what could be what what might be when it takes place. Well finally in 1936 uh, they determined that four different mothers were proud producers of nine children. Can you imagine that? Just think if you were the one who had eight children. But anyways, uh, nine children and, and each of them had that in that ten-year span. So those four ended up dividing uh, Charles Millar's request, each receiving at that time an approximate value of $125,000. Now, to help put that all in perspective, $125,000 in 1936 dollars compared to today would be approximately $2.25 million today. See, Charles Millar, 
He left a legacy of one who really always liked to kind of stir the pot and get the people going. Now, let's look at him in comparison to Jesus. To Jesus when he left this earth. When he left the earth, he bequeathed a different type of legacy to his followers. No, his legacy did not uh, include large sums of cash. It did not include all kinds of, of highly valued, uh, precious family heirlooms. Instead, the gift that he left behind was the Holy Spirit. He left behind the Holy Spirit to comfort, to guide, to call, gather, enlighten, and empower the entire Christian church on earth so that the church then could do and be everything that God had called them to do and, and accomplish all that God desired them to accomplish. And so today, today we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit to the Christian church, really the birthday of the Christian church. Think about it. After the crucifixion, and we know the story quite well, the disciples, they were terrified for their lives. Oftentimes, they would be found behind locked doors. Not anymore. The coming of the Holy Spirit transformed these fearful disciples from, from fear into total, complete faithfulness to the Lord. See, the Holy Spirit gave them courage, courage to go out into the streets of Jerusalem and declare the resurrection of Jesus to a city who not that long before had put him to death and declared that they would put them to death as well. And you know, it's, it's really kind of interesting when you take a closer look and examination of it that Peter, the Peter that we read in the book of Acts he seems so different from the Peter that we, we read about in the Gospels. You see, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was able to mold Peter and, and to shape Peter uh, so that he would be able to do immeasurably more than Peter himself thought would be possible, or even those around him thought could be possible as well. Oh, his boldness remained that we were used to reading about in the Gospels, but it was a boldness that, that functioned without so much foolishness that oftentimes seemed to accompany him uh, in the gospel lessons. Uh, and so, but yet, he was, still, he was still the same Peter. You see, after the Spirit came to him, Peter did not become a robot, but rather he became an individual of, a, of great focus and determination to proudly proclaim the gospel message of, of God's love to everybody uh, that he came across. He was totally unhindered, and, and it was an amazing transformation, really, that took place in Peter. See, Peter's bold courage was exhibited, that was exhibited throughout the gospels that we saw, but, but here we see that following uh, the, the giving of the Holy Spirit, that Peter, he had a boldness, but his trust was, was not in himself, was not in his own skills, but rather it was a reliance on the Holy Spirit and the power that the Holy Spirit would provide. Now, in, in today's readings, we also hear how Peter quoted the Old Testament prophet Joel. Joel, who, who foretold and prophesied about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and, and the growth of the Christian church that would take place after the Holy Spirit had come. And it's an awesome thing for us to know and realize and hold on today that this self-same Spirit that was poured out upon the disciples back then is the same one that is poured about, uh, upon each and every one of you here today as well. Just think for a moment how powerful Jesus' legacy really is. Now, there's no doubt that if the Holy Spirit had not been poured out to the disciples, that Christianity and the church would never have spread like it did after the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, chances are that those who had known Jesus, those who had followed Jesus, they, they may have held on to their belief for a while, and maybe even to the point when they, when they uh, finally died. But at best, Christianity would have just lingered on for a short period of time before it would finally uh, merge back into mainstream Judaism. However, such was not the case. And even though that was not the case, it's sad to say that today, uh, 
the church, that, that many of, of us who follow Jesus yet today have not fully tapped into the power of the Holy Spirit in our personal lives and in the church as we should. Oftentimes, unfortunately, we have taken for granted and not uh, the, the, the working of the Holy Spirit and have not really accepted the responsibility that God has given us to share this message uh, as we should. And, and it's really a privilege for us to share this message of God's love with those that he placed around us. And when thinking about that privilege that has been given to each and every one of us, I can't help but think about a story that was told that was intended to emphasize how important it is that we, you and I, together take up the torch of Christ's ministry with a great deal of commitment. Now in this story, as it is told, Jesus returns to heaven uh, after his time here on earth. And as he returns to heaven, all of the angels gather around him because they want to, to, uh, they're excited to hear about the stories that he's going to share with them about what happened. And he shared with them all the mi different miracles that he performed. He shared with them all the di different teaching opportunities that he had. He shared with them about his death and, and his resurrection as well. When he finished his story, Michael, the archangel, asked Jesus, said, uh, what happens now? And Jesus then goes on and says, well, I have left behind 11 faithful disciples and a handful of men and women who have faithfully followed me. He went on and said, they are the ones. They are the ones who will declare my message and, and express my love to the world around them. They are the ones who will build my church. And Michael then responds with saying, but... But what if these people, what if they fail? What is, what is your other plan? And Jesus said, there is no other plan. Friends, as part of the body of Christ, we, like the disciples, have been charged, we've been entrusted with the responsibility of proclaiming the gospel message of God's love. We are the ones that God has chosen to bring this life-changing message to the world around us. Here's the kicker. He's counting on us. He's relying on us to do just that. And to help us, he has sent the Holy Spirit to shape us, to mold us, to fill us, to use us, to accomplish his good and gracious will. On Pentecost nearly 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit gave the disciples the ability to speak in other languages so that those who were gathered there would be able to hear that gospel message for the first time in their own native language and they would be able to understand what it is that the disciples had to say. Today, today his approach is a bit different. He has given each and every one of us different talents, different skills, different abilities to get the job done. And we are able to do this because the Holy Spirit is working in us and through us to make sure that it gets done. If we try to do it on our own, we're surely going to fail. But as we rely on Him, there's absolutely no doubt that no job is too big, no task is too small, no undertaking is too overwhelming that it cannot be done. Because the Holy Spirit is always going to be there with us to help rise us to the occasion, even giving us the very words so that we get the job done. It's true. won't always be easy. won't always be fun. But as we remember what the Lord has gone through for us, we're always able to have a peace of mind, knowing that we're not alone, but that he is forever and always with us. What an amazing legacy of love that he has bequeathed to us. In his name, amen. And now, may the peace of God, which far surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in true faith to life everlasting. Amen.